Good afternoon. My name is Whitney Pipkin. I'm a freelance journalist. As Michelle mentioned, I write about food, agriculture, and the environment and how they go together, how they intersect. Um, for publications like the Washington Post, Elevation DC, and um, I'm a staff writer for the Chesapeake Bay Journal as well. I'll be moderating our panel discussion today, and if you're live tweeting, the tweet is uh, Chefs for Change. That's the hashtag, rather. Um, but first, I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, who probably needs no introduction. Um, Spike Jardy first entered Baltimore's culinary scene in 1991 when he opened Spike and Charlie's with his brother. Even then, Spike was committed to cooking local and seasonal ingredients. And for this and other reasons, he quickly was set apart as a chef worth watching. Over the years, Spike continued to set trends in the Baltimore dining scene at many restaurants, from the neighborhood bistro called Junior, seafood restaurant Atlantic, um, the Pan Latin Joy American Cafe, and an Italian concept called Vespa. Today, Spike's name is synonymous with thoughtful chefdom. He opened his award-winning Woodbury Kitchen in 2007 with an unprecedented commitment to sustainable and local sourcing in the Chesapeake Bay region. At last year's Chefs as a Catalyst event, Spike shared with us how he scraped through his first winter cooking with uh, an all-local menu when there was barely than en enough local food to provide. Since then, he's worked to solve that predicament um, by expanding his kitchen's food preservation methods, among other things and by providing farmers a steady market for, so that they can actually plan um, on supplying it. And yet, somehow, Spike finds the time and energy to stay up to date on the issues that impact chefs in the DC Baltimore area. While the rest of us talk about how to feed a growing world and how to translate these important messages to the audiences in your kitchens, Spike is in many ways a pioneer worth emulating. I look forward to hearing what he's been up to lately and would like you to welcome him with me. Spike, come on up. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for that. And uh, thanks, um, everybody, Michelle and um, the organizers, for having me back. I don't think I've ever been invited back <laughs> to something before. And it's, it's really a treat to be here. I thought this event was amazing last year. I was really thrilled to be a part of it and, and thrilled once again to be in front of you. Um, you know, when you're a chef, there's always a little risk uh, when you're invited to do something like this that you're asked to do it because they're hoping you'll bring some food. And uh, <laughs> we'll just do a little tasting on the side if you could. Um, so I didn't want to disappoint anybody. I did bring something to eat. Um, I got some, um, something I really want you to think about for a second. And these are, uh, this is rye um, from one of my favorite farmers in the whole world, Heinz Tomei at uh, Next Step. Yes, and uh, yeah, you're so fortunate to have him at your farmer's market uh, uh, at DuPont Circle. I, I, I'm very jealous. We have to, we make the drive almost every week to, to see him. And he's, he's selling us incredible rye now uh, that we're using. Um, he's actually grinding it into, uh, milling it into a flour. We're also using it whole, as you see it there. Uh, but the, the reason I wanted to take a second to, to consider this seed um, was, um, I guess because I wanted to talk a little bit about agriculture before I, I, I talk about what's going on at Woodbury, and the two are um, in, inextricably linked. Um, you know, 12,000 years ago, a remarkable thing happened. Instead of eating uh, this wild, uh, what would have been a wild, delicious seed, um, probably after it had been threshed, uh, using a little bit of heat, uh, ground into some kind of paste uh, like dough, and then cooked on a hot rock, uh, a Neolithic person, um, probably a woman, uh, planted it in the ground. Um, it's next to impossible to say where this, something like this would have happened um, or exactly when. It could have been the Middle East, it could have been Southeast Asia, it could have been Central uh, America. Um, but I believe that that was the pivotal moment, I think, in the long history of how we feed ourselves. Um, nothing that has happened before, including domestication of ruminants, uh, for food and dogs, for herding, um, the application of heat to meat, what we now call roasting, which had already happened, even the identification and enjoyment of all five natural sources of caffeine, which had also already happened, interestingly enough, um, really had the impact that this simple act. And nothing that really, I think, has come afterwards, you know, whether it's you know, various ways of cooking, uh, earthenware cooking vessels, or even the microwave oven, I don't think any of it really can touch what happened 
when a person deliberately returned a seed to the ground. And of course, I'm simplifying things a little bit, but it turns out that that seed and that act contain not only the um, potential for the growth of a plant, but also for the establishment of civilization and ultimately the transformation of our planet. Um, now, what fascinates me about this moment is that we really don't know what inspired or compelled her to take this step. Hunting and gathering had been how humans had fed themselves for 500,000 years or more, depending on how you really define human. Uh, the population of the planet at that point, this is again around 12,000 years ago, was maybe around 10 million people, um, as opposed to the 7 billion we're, we're up against right now. Uh, so diverse sources of wild foods um, were believed to be um, abundant and dependable enough to feed everyone. And if scarcity were a cause, it would be hard to imagine her thinking, I'm hungry now, so I'm going to put this seed back in the dirt and hope for more six months uh, down the road. Um, and there are many, many, many theories about this moment. My take uh, is that the act of planting the seed was based on the observation of a natural system, in this case, possibly a, a, a field of, um, of wild grain, a grass, um, combined with the universal human impulse to improve things. In other words, observation of, of seed and growing uh, led to not only sustenance, but a thought that I, I can maybe do better. And I think that, as much as anything, has set the tone and, and kind of the pace of improvement in agriculture to this day. So here we are 12,000 years later, uh, improving the hell out of everything, every aspect of agriculture, um, with often miraculous results. Um, we have the capacity to feed the world's 7 billion inhabitants, you know, and whether we do that well or justly is a, is a, is a different question, but we, I think we can at this point do that. Uh, we can get, you know, more than a million calories from an acre of corn, food calories. And we can all go to, walk down the street right now and buy strawberries in the middle of, um, of October. Um, all kind of miraculous if you think about it. You know, but for me, and this is where Woodbury kind of started to take shape, is that I, I, became, I came to realize that these improvements, especially in the recent, um, in recent history, have come at a mounting cost. Um, and to name just a few, we're losing arable land to erosion at a rate of around 24 million acres a year. And that's more than 10 times uh, the farmland uh, that we j have just in Maryland. Um, that's globally. Chemical inputs such as pesticides, that you all know this, um, are the basis that are the basis for much of our agar in our air and water. There's no doubt about that. Nutrient runoff from excess fertilizers causing hypoxia or low oxygen in our coastal waters, including, of course, our beautiful Chesapeake Bay. Uh, genetic diversity, and this one is, is, I don't think, commented on enough. Genetic diversity of domesticated animals and plants that was built up over thousands of years of agriculture is being wiped out by standardized breeding programs. Fossil fuel intensive farming practices are, are obviously, and again, you all know this, contributing to climate change. And much of the food being grown is not as nutrient dense, as healthy, or as delicious as it should be. Finally, small scale farmers, this is near and dear to me, are not making money, and their numbers continue to, to decrease. Um, so, not a very pretty picture of where we are. You know, sometimes I think that we're driving so quickly towards so many different cliffs. The only question is, which one do we drive off first? Um, and it's, it's a tough, to me, it's a very fairly bleak picture. And I guess the question we can all ask ourselves uh, is, what can you do about it? Um, what is the response to, to so much bad news when it comes to agriculture? And my response was that I would open Woodbury Kitchen. And it wasn't quite as simple as that. It wasn't quite as linear as that. And I'm not trying to give myself any more credit uh, than I could possibly uh, deserve, which isn't a ton. But uh, I, we made the commitment, and we stuck by it. And um, it's, it became clear to me that my deepest connection and the, the thing that I cared the most about was trying to think about ag and, and, and respect it. And, do right by it, and if I can, make good decisions based on what I understood, and that's what you see at every, every day at Woodbury Kitchen. And on one level, it's, it's tremendously inspiring to me because now I have, you know, along with Amy and I, we have 100 or 110 people at last count uh, that are working side by side with us, and not only do they do, they do the work, but they totally get uh, what, what, it, what it's all about, and it's, I, I can't tell you what an inspiring place that is to be. So. Uh, it's true, what, what Whitney said I, did, said, I did share kind of the dire uh, story of our first year at Woodbury. 
um, when we were really learning about a lot of the mechanics and, and what the implications of local sourcing would be uh, last time. And so I, I, I just wanted to, to give a, a brief update of what we've been up to this year. Um, we have taken our canning and expanded it tenfold from where we were last year, and we were able to do that because we moved it to a new, a new restaurant that had an enormous kitchen. Um, we have been working diligently over the last four and a half months to get our state approval so that we can sell the same great products that we love using as ingredients in our restaurants uh, to the public and hopefully even to other wholesale users if there's interest, and I believe that there is. Um, we're, 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 I believe, very close to, to getting our final approval, our inspections and approval, which will let us uh, go into next year uh, running hard and, and processing a lot of great local uh, and a, a lot, very much of it organic uh, produce, tomatoes, pickles, jams and jellies, all of it. Um, at the same time, in that same facility, we've opened a cool little diner uh, called Shoe Fly uh, that we believe uh, brings the exact same sourcing commitments that we've made at Woodbury to an entire, entirely different experience. Uh, we're very excited about that. We think we have great eggs and great bacon to start with. Um, and so the diner thing kind of flows very easily for us and we're having a lot of fun there. We're a week into it and I can't wait to get back there uh, in a few hours and see how they're doing. Um, it's been a lot of fun and we are in a very cool kind of uh, market area of the city that is, is also experiencing an upswing. There's a great uh, historic theater that's been um, renovated. It's a really special place to be in Baltimore. We're thrilled to be there. Um, so that's Shoe Fly. That's our canning and it is, as I said, uh, growing by leaps and bounds, and I think next year is going to be a spectacular year with our full, um, our full um, approvals from the state. Uh, we're doing an extremely wide range of baking, including with local grains. Uh, it's very difficult to find uh, locally grown and milled grains in the mid-Atlantic, but we're very lucky to be working with four separate farmers who are growing and milling on the farm, um, including whole wheat uh, or wheat, rye, barley. Um, we get whole oats, um, and we're just thrilled to be using these grains uh, as much we're learning a lot about uh, working with whole grains and baking with whole grains, and it's been a tremendous um, challenge and very rewarding uh, to be able to, to work more grains into our, uh, the baking that we're doing at Woodbury and by extension for the other places. Um, butchery, I'm very excited to talk about a butcher shop that we're working on. We're calling Parts and Labor in uh, a very cool neighborhood in Baltimore called Remington. It'll have 3,000 square foot of, feet of production butcher shop as, long, as well as a small restaurant and, um, and um, retail area. So this will allow us, uh, which is critical, to grow the, the whole animal butchery and the direct relationship sourcing that we have with small animal producers in, in Maryland and Pennsylvania uh, and help those guys who are really on the razor's edge of, of economic survival continue their operations and do their incredible work. Um, so we're looking forward to moving to that, moving into that. Um, it's under construction right now. We hope that it's finished by the end of the year and then we're, we're completely excited about that. And the last little thing I want to share is, is kind of a, uh, maybe a hopeful little story about what, what maybe could be described as progress. And that is a conversation that I started with Heinz, um, the grower of, these, these rye, of this rye, um, a year and a half ago, which was uh, I saw that he was doing grain and I, I visited him and seen his, his, his combine from, from the 40s and all the other crazy stuff that he had invested thousands, hundreds of, oh, 100,000 or so dollars in. And uh, I asked him a simple question, which was, could you grow mustard seed? We had never been able to, we had never bothered making our own mustard because we couldn't source uh, great local mustard seed. But I, I had an inkling that, that mustard had been grown in the mid-Atlantic in the past and was kind of part of our whole snack culture here. And Heinz was up to the task of figuring out really the hard part of how it gets grown, processed, handled, and, and delivered to me. And I'm really proud of the fact that this year I took, I, I took delivery of and paid for 288 pounds of of beautiful yellow mustard seed from Heinz uh, that I'm now in the process, a little bit of cart before the horse, but I'm now in the process of figuring out how to make mustard out of it. Um, and it's just, you know, it's one of those little things that we really kind of view our progress. You know, that, that's progress for us is when I can take something that I haven't been buying and sourcing locally and, and buy it from a farmer and support him, and especially some, somebody like Heinz who's made um, um, some serious investment in being able to work with grain, and I thought mustard might be a fit. And it looks like it is. And now he's, he's asking me, like, how much can I grow for you next year? So it looks like we're going to grow it and, and have great locally sourced and, and produced mustard in our restaurants. And it's especially important, I guess, if you have a diner that you have some really good mustard. We're finding that out. Um, and, you know, that's, that's kind of the news, uh, such as it is from, from uh, Woodbury. Uh, 
maybe not as funny or as interesting as Lake Wobegon, but it's, it's uh, still a place that we're very proud of and we all feel slightly above average. Um, you know, the one, one last thing that I wanted to touch on, which is, um, and even as we were driving down here, um, I was talking to somebody that was working on an article, and it's great, you know, whenever there's the story is getting told, however it is. Um, but, you know, I feel like a lot of this conversation is being steered uh, in a certain direction, um, which is, is less than, um, I think, um, helpful. Um, and it, it's, it's not, um, well, let me talk about it for a second. Farm to table is something that you hear a lot about. And I, 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 we started out, I think, proudly farm to table at Woodbury six years ago. And I really think it's time that we, to, we move behind, beyond, beyond this phrase. And those of us who are thinking carefully about this and care a lot about it, I think farm to table is, is, is done and um, um, for a lot of reasons. And the most obvious being that on some very basic level, all food is farm to table. And I see pl people now, entities, businesses, kind of taking advantage of that fact because it's a claim that you cannot either support or, or disprove. Um, and, you know, we, I do a program with, with uh, fourth graders in Baltimore, and, and we talk a lot about food and farms, and, and one of the challenges we, we put out to them is name a food that doesn't come from a farm. And they're really great about it, and they, 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 they come up with a lot of great answers, but it turns out that we kind of prove to, to ourselves that almost all the food that we eat comes from a farm, and that includes a lot of fish and shellfish now, obviously. Um, Sometimes somebody will say salt, and I think they're, they're right about that, and kids actually come up with that one, which I think is really neat. But, um, you know, there's that, and there's the, um, um, I think there are better ways to talk about it, and I think there are ways that would exclude that kind of glib or superficial way of saying we're farm to table. Um, you know, if you're trying to say that it's a more direct thing, I think that may be the case, but there's no doubt in my mind that, that eventually aggregation and distribution are going to become a part of this picture. They, I think that will, I hope that happens in a thoughtful and respectful way, but I think that's coming, and I don't think that will um, affect our, our, our thinking about farm to table. I do think that, that thinking about community sourcing um, maybe does a better job at least of, of describing what we do at Woodbury, because I feel like there is a community around food, um, not around Woodbury, but around food uh, that is is supporting the restaurant and we are supporting it. And I really feel like when I'm calling a grower or a cheesemaker or you know, any of these incredible food ar artisans that are now working in uh, you know, making incredible kombucha, for example, um, I'm participating in this community. I love that and I think it's a lot more descriptive. I think even open source maybe is something we should think about um, as, as in a sense that we could really take back uh, how we eat and what we eat uh, and not make it dependent on or limited by the agency of, of large corporations. This is another thought, but I really, I would love to see us move beyond farm to table as kind of a descriptor. And I think the last one, which we all struggle with, is sustainability. And I'm, I'm, really, I'm really frustrated by sustainability as just being this parking spot uh, for a lot of vague ideas um, of what's a better way of doing things without any real metric or any actual deep thought about what that could mean. Um, I think there are great definitions out there about what sustainability really means. Um, you know, whether it's on a global basis and we're thinking about the regenerative power of our biosphere or specific practices um, that from which um, the, the conservation of, of, of resources is, is a consequence of the, um, of the production. There are great ways to think about it, important ways to think about it, but I think sustainable or sustainability as kind of this, this catch-all is, is very troubling to me. Um, we are in a, as I kind of pointed out earlier, we're in a very, very difficult place uh, with, with agriculture, with this planet. And to think that there are somehow sustainable aspects of it that should be preserved to me is, is troubling. Um, sustainable seafood is a great example. We have a lot of claims about sustainable seafood. I see it in retail, I see it on restaurant menus. And I'm, I'm worried that we're, we're missing the point. Uh, and the point is, is that the oceans are basically interconnected in ways that we, I'm sure, don't even fully comprehend at this point. And um, we've lost more than 95% of the biomass of the oceans over the last 400 years. And there's no getting around that. You can say that rockfish is sustainable all you want, and I'd love to believe that that's true, and I'm working to understand how true that is. But this whole idea of sustainable seafood to me is very troubling and hard to, hard to uh, claim that's very difficult to support. So just <laughs> that might be a brief aside. You know, what I'm really hoping is that we, today we can plant some more seeds um, and I hope that, especially with young people that are here, if you are here, and if you're thinking about food, if you're cooking, if you are feeding people in any way, that you begin to see yourself as part of this amazing 10,000 year journey we've taken uh, with our agriculture. 
and start to think about what you're doing in those terms. And again, thank you for listening.